that's having the baby? Yeah. We prayed for pastor's daughter and uh, hadn't been able to have a baby and now she's having one. Hallelujah. Just by the way, if it's, if it's a boy, it's Thomas. It's not Thomas. <laughs> Praise God. God is so good, church. God is so good. To think that 43 years ago, 45 years ago, whatever it was, this place didn't exist. And how many thousands have been through these doors in the last 45 years? God is so good. How hungry are we for God? When I look at the church today, now my wife and I, we, I love to boast in this. We have been in Pentecost for over 100 years. Not many people can say that. Both of us came into Pentecost when we were five years of age. And I'm 65 and she's 21. <laughs> so most of it's on my side now, but we've had the privilege. But you know, we've also seen a few tragedies. We've seen the church water down. We've seen the church become weak and weak. We're in Pentecost. A third, if not more, of the people don't even come to church until the singing's over. Most churches today have closed their Sunday night meeting. And those that still have their Sunday night meeting only full, pull a fraction of the people out. Now meetings are not the issue. It's what my wife was saying. It's not about coming to church. Because we can come to church on a Sunday morning and we can come to church on a Sunday night and we can come to the Wednesday prayer meeting, we can come to the Friday prayer meeting and go to hell. What are we going to do tomorrow morning when we wake up? Are we going to lift our hands and say, Oh, glory, Jesus. It's Monday. I have the joy of going to work today. I have the joy of sharing the love of Jesus Christ with all my workmates. I am an ambassador for Christ. Are we living are we living the presence of God everywhere we go? Last Sunday was Easter. One of the tragedies that I find in the church again today, and I'm going to tie this up. I'm not condemning the church. God loves the church. He sent his son to die for the church. So when we finish this message tonight, this morning, we're going to tie this all together. And you'll see the love of God. For you, for you, one example, and I may repeat it, is that Peter denied Christ at the very hour that Christ needed him. But afterwards, when Christ had risen from the grave and he was in that upper room, he looked at Peter and his love went out to Peter. And Christ is looking at you, the church, and his love is going out to you. But some 2,000 years ago, Last week we celebrated Easter. 30 years before that, a young baby was born. We know the story oh so well. We celebrate it every Christmas. We need to learn to celebrate it every day. At the age of 12, this young boy was able to go to the temple. And we read the story from the Word of God where in the temple, they went for the, the feast and so forth, and then the parents, uh, with everyone else, was journeying back home. Uh, they're on a three-day journey, and they realize their son is not there. They have to turn around and go back. They turn around and they go back, and when they go back, they find their 12-year-old son sitting in the temple, debating and answering questions with the lawyers and the religious leaders. From that moment forward, 
There were people in that room that looked at that 12-year-old boy and within their mind they said, this is a problem. This is a problem. A few years go by and Luke chapter 4 tells us that Christ at the age of 30 walks into where John was baptizing, goes down into the water and is baptized in the water and as he comes up out of that water the heavens open and God speaks and says this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased and at that very moment a dove, a white dove flies by and that white dove represents the Holy Ghost and from there we read that Christ is then taken into the wilderness where he is tempted of the devil. At that baptism of Christ, there were men there. Perhaps the same men who sat in that temple with Christ when he was 12 years of age. And perhaps they remembered and they said, we said he was going to be problem. And even from the outset of the ministry of Jesus Christ, we read that man and Satan really had one ambition. And that ambition was to destroy this Jesus of Nazareth. So he's in the wilderness and Satan tries to tempt him. Satan tries to destroy him. And then we read in Luke chapter 4 that at the end of 40 days, uh, he comes back out. Uh, he goes back into that temple uh, and he sits in that temple and he picks up the word of God and begins to read the word of God. Then he sits down and all eyes are upon him. And he stands and says, this has been fulfilled in your day. Basically, he's saying, I am the Son of God. <coughs> From that moment we see that man grab hold of him uh, and they drag him out of the temple and they take him to a cliff ready to throw him over. Their ambition from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ was to destroy Jesus Christ. They would send their lawyers. As Christ's ministry began to grow, crowds began to come. First of all, a thousand, then two thousand, and then as high as twenty thousand people would come and listen to the teaching. And the Word of God tells us in Mark chapter 1 and verse 21 22 that the people were amazed at the authority in the teaching of Jesus Christ. Why, not only were the people amazed, but the Word of God tells us that demons would flee at the mention of Jesus Christ. And so the religious, the Jews, would send their people, their lawyers, to debate with him, and they loved to debate, but each time they would leave with mud on their face as Christ would answer their question, sometimes by throwing back another question. So the Jews were challenged. The Jews were concerned about this Jesus of Nazareth. But as, the, uh, as his popularity began to grow, uh, as he went uh, and was speaking, and Jairus, uh, even a, a leader, came to him and says, My daughter is sick. And he goes with Jairus. And he goes into Jairus' house and puts the people out. And he raises this dead girl to life. The crowds begin to grow. And the cow crowds begin to grow. They could debate with Christ. But they had no answer to the miracles. They had no answer to the woman with the issue of blood who came out and broke every religious law that the Jews had. 
and yet walked away totally healed. They had no answer. They had no answer when there was a multitude of people that were listening to him preach and he preached for so long. It's amazing today if we preach for an hour and people start leaving church. But he preached for so long that the, the sun was gone and the darkness began to come and it was time to feed. And so he fed the multitude with just a child's lunch. They had no answer for the lepers who came and said, please have compassion on us. And the leprosy left. But because of his popularity, the Jews sought to kill him. The Romans, who really didn't care about these people at all, so long as there was peace in the house, started to come into the picture and thought, is this really the king of the Jews? We need to watch this guy. Is this guy going to cause us problems? And then we probably have the climax of it all. In the Gospel of Mark at chapter 11, we read in the Gospel of Mark chapter 11 that Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem and, and they get a donkey and they, they put Christ on the donkey. And the people take their coats off and, and spread the coats all over the road and they put leaves on the road and they began to sing, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! For here the people thought they found the king. He, the people, thought it is time for Jesus to take the throne and replace the Romans. But then a few moments later, he goes into the temple. And when he goes into the temple, he sees that the religious leaders are not concerned about God. The religious leaders are not concerned about the things of God. The religious leaders are only concerned about their own pockets and what they can gain or not gain. You say, why did he do that? They were selling the sacrifices. They were selling them eight times higher than what you could buy them outside. And from there, things begin to change. The Jews have decided he must die. The people, when they realize that he wasn't going to be their king, leave him. And so in Matthew, and let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. And in Matthew 26 and verse 17, we won't read it because of time's sake, but in Matthew 26 and verse 17, we now see that Jesus is in the upper room. And the only people that are in that upper room are his faithful 12 disciples. Where's the woman with the issue of life? Where's Jairus? Or even better, where's Lazarus? It was only just a couple of days ago that he rose Lazarus from the grave. Where's Mary? Where's Martha? But we see here in, cha in chapter 26 and verse 17, that Christ begins and looks at the people and he says to, the, to his disciples there, don't worry about the crowds because before this day is finished, you also will leave me. Peter stands up and says, no way. There's no way. I'll go to the grave for you. 
If we shoot quickly across to John chapter 11, we'll read that when Jesus got word about Lazarus, that Lazarus was die, had died or was dying, and finally Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to my friend Lazarus. The disciples tried to stop him and said, they will imprison you. They will kill you. Thomas stood up and said, well, I'll go. We may as well die with you. And yet here Jesus is saying to these same men, before this day is out, you will deny me. So we go to Matthew 26 and verse 32. But after I have been arisen, I will go before you in Galilee. You know, Christ talks to us every day. If we're the church, Christ talks to us every day. The tragedy is, we don't listen. We don't listen. Here he said to the disciples, he began to teach the disciples about the revelation that he must die. For that's the purpose he came. That's the reason he came. That's why he came to this earth. That's why he took off deity and came down as a man. So he says to the disciples, now listen to me carefully. After I have risen, I will go before thee, Galilee. <clears throat> now we don't have time to get into it today. You can study it. Or in a couple of months, watch my videos. I'll be on videos there. But you'll find the disciples didn't go to Galilee. They were hiding in a room. And even when the women who saw Jesus and went to the grave and saw that the grave was empty and the, and the angel said to him, he is not here, he has risen, go and tell the disciples and Peter. They still didn't believe. Just as we sit in church every Sunday and don't believe. Oh, good work, Pastor Tom. But I wonder here, this morning, if we really believe what I'm sharing, I wonder how many are going to come back tonight. That tells me the story. I go to a church of five or six hundred people. We have a Sunday night service. We pull about 40, 50 people out. Where's the other 450 people? You want to know? Most of them are home watching TV. Most of them are home letting sex scenes into their house. Most of them are home letting murder into their house. Most of them are home are, are letting arguments and everything else into their house. And then they wonder why they don't hear from God. Let's read on. Peter answered, we'll jump down. Let's jump down to verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Now listen. They're in the upper room. They had communion. It was now time. And so he takes the disciples and they go. They've been to Gethsemane many times. It was his praying area. Gethsemane was not an attractive garden. And you know, this is a picture of sin. Gethsemane is full of graves. Gethsemane is dirty. And those that have been there, I haven't been there, but I've been to Ephesus and many of the other places. And they're dry lands. And they're not attractive lands. And to me, Gethsemane is a picture of sin. The sin of the world. Because the original man that was created was created in a perfect garden. And the work that Christ did on the cross was going to take us back to that perfect garden. You see, we shouldn't be living in the feet of church. 
We shouldn't be living in bondage church. We shouldn't be living in sickness church. We shouldn't be living in defeat church. Because on the cross, when Christ stood on that cross and he cried out those words, it is finished. He took the church from Gethsemane to the Garden of Eden. And that's where we should be dwelling. So that Christ could walk down the gardens as God did to Adam and Eve. And Christ could walk with them arm in arm and talk about their events, talk about why they're under stress, talk about why they're living in defeat. Be share with them. That's what God wants to do with us today. That's the relationship that I ended into and will stay because there's no other way. Don't look at the obstacles. When I was here last time and you guys helped, I told you I was going to Kenya. We didn't know anyone in Kenya. We, I went there for seven weeks. I turned churches down because I had to be home. We saw over 200 miracles. I've stopped at 200. We saw 12 people healed of cancer. One lady came direct from hospital with the x-rays and everything. Couldn't walk into the church. And yet after prayer, all pain left. She ran around the building for around eight minutes. Came forward and I said to her, how do you feel? And she said, a little worn out, but great. <laughs> she couldn't walk into the building. We saw deaf ears open. You can see these on my channel, YouTube. They're in proof on the table. We saw blind eyes open. One lady in Eldoret could, couldn't read without her glasses. And, and so I took the glasses off and we prayed for her. And I put the Bible in front of her and I said, read this. And the next thing she screamed, fell on her face, worshiping God, reading without glasses. That's what happens in God and me. That's what happens. Everywhere I go, we see miracles. Baby being conceived. Last week, we had a guy, Pastor Paddy, come to our services, been in the ministry for many years. His daughter's son in our services. Beautiful, beautiful voice. You should get them over. Beautiful, beautiful voices. Unbelievable worship. Has a church in, in Canberra. And... Uh, the father come. He had diabetes. God healed him of diabetes. But it destroyed his kidneys. And so he's got to go on dialysis. He started dialysis last two weeks ago. Came to the service last Sunday. Looked worn out. Looked tired. We prayed for him. Went back to the doctors on Tuesday for the dialysis. And the doctors were amazed. They couldn't believe how well he was. His blood readings was good. Everything was good. We went there Friday night to have fellowship with them and to pray for him again. We got there at 7 o'clock. We left at 11.30. He never stopped talking the whole night. We shared the word of God. We worshiped. They cooked a meal that only Samoans can cook. So much difference in his life. Why? Because we're in the garden. So let's get back because our time is going. And so they're going out into Gethsemane. And the disciples must have thought there's something different, something wrong. Christ wasn't himself. From the time they left that upper room and they're walking to the Garden of Eden, Christ is quiet. He seems burdened down. He's never burdened down. This was the part like this. This guy was so positive. He was sinless. There was nothing that could hurt him. He was about to make one of the greatest decisions of his life, a decision that changed the course of history. And I'm not talking about the cross. I'm talking about something more important than even the cross. Because it says that he came to this garden and he said, in this garden, he says, you guys wait here. Peter, John and James, 
You come over here with me. You stand there, don't move. And then he walked to come over to here. He, it says he wanted to go a throne store way. He wanted to be alone with his father. I wonder if the church today really want to be alone with the father. Oh, well, I do, but you know, my favorite show's on the mama. Home and alone. Your sister's hooked on that, not her, thank God. We don't watch TV. We watch the Word of God. And so he went a stone's throw away. But the Word tells us that from there to here, he couldn't go to there. He was so burdened, he fell to the ground. His disciples were still there. And he's on the ground. And he's praying. And he's saying, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And he prays for an hour, crying out to God, What is this cup he's praying about? What is this thing he doesn't want? It's not the cross. The cross is in God's divine plan, but it's not the cross. After an hour, he staggers to his feet, lay down on the ground. He staggers to his feet, and he comes over to Peter, James, and John. And there is something. And he wakes them up. Wake up. If they sit up, you can sit. But stay there. And you know Jesus is saying today. He's in God and you sin. He's on his knees crying out to God. Father! And you know the first tragedy. He looks around him. Where's the woman with the issue of life? Where's Lazarus, who just a few days ago had raised him from the dead? Where's the leper that was cleansed? Where's the blind man that can now see? Where's the deaf people who can now hear? Where are my disciples? Where is my church? Where is my church? So he gets back on his knees, goes and leaves John, Peter and James, falls on his knees again, you can lay down again. He prays for them. up after another hour goes over and they're asleep this time he lets them sleep and this time he goes and falls on his face again alone no one with him no one's there you know right now the word of God tells me that Christ is on his knees interceding for the church the church is in trouble Christ can see it. He's interceding for the church. Oh my God. Now look at what you can see. I can see deep and down. Oh my God. And then he looks to his left. And he looks to the right. Who's with him? Who's with him? Are we the church interceding with him? God has given us a commission in 2017 to see revival come to Australia. For the last 20 years, we've traveled the world preaching the gospel, but Christ told us that this year is Australia's year. Now, I don't believe we're going to see revival in 2017, as we understand it. But what is happening right now, church? There are thousands of people 
throughout Australia. You may be one of them. There are thousands of people right now throughout Australia who are interceding in the spirit realm. You see, for the last 30 years, maybe longer, but for the last 30 years, we've given Satan free reign. And he's built a barrier in the spirit realm. And that's why we don't see the miracles. That's why we see empty seats in our church. That's why, because... You know, I could go to Africa. I could take my youngest grandson here to Africa. I could put him behind the book, but I could put him out here praying for people. And they'll get healed. So why don't they get healed in Australia? They do, but in, in less numbers. Because of the warfare we need to break through the spirit now. So what is this cup? What is this cup? He gets down for the third time and he says, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, I love this, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What's he talking about, church? Before I answer it, let's go to Luke. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. <clears throat> chapter 22 and verse 43. Oops, I've looked up. Verse 41, it says, we'll just read, we're going to re relapse here for a moment. It says, and he withdrew himself about a stone throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And it says, in the midst of this agony, and this is an encouragement for us, church. In the midst of this agony, the next verse tells us that God sent an angel to minister to him. When you're interceding, when you're praying to break through, when you think it's hopeless, when you think there's no hope for the church, when you think that the church is not going to turn around. And I'm not talking about having super churches. I'm talking, we are the church. We are the ones that's got to change. And when you may be interceding and you may be crying out, even for your own body, even for your own life, and say, God, I want to change. I want to know your will for my life. Why is there a deadness? Why is there no communication with us? We're frustrated that we're heavy burden. It says at that moment, God sends his angels to minister to us. God sends his angels. But let me show you the extent. This is a powerful verse, this next one. Verse 43. Then the angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. Verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnest. Then he sweat, became like great drops of blood, falling to the ground. Two things, and we're going to close. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass by me. What's he talking about? He's not talking about the cross. He's not talking about the whipping and the tearing of a, a, a part of his body. And that's a story in its own. We don't have time to go, go into that today. So what is the cup? You can get up, mate. Sit on your seat. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Very good. Harrison said you used me last time. Don't use me this time. What's he talking about? What 
made him so earnest, so anxious, that his body began to drop blood all over his clothes. His clothes were wringing wet with blood. There was blood on the ground. Even when he got up and went to the soldiers, he was still covered in blood. What took him to that? What is this cup? Christ was perfect. John 1.1 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Christ was without sin. As Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Eden had never experienced sin until they ate of that fruit. Then they experienced sin. Well, up to this moment, Christ had never experienced sin. But the cup that he asked God to take away from him was your sin, was my sin, was your shortcomings, was my shortcomings. You see, if he didn't submit to God in the garden of Eden right there, if he went to the cross without taking your sin and my sin, it would have been fruitless. But in that garden, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. In the garden of Gethsemane, he took my sins. And I'm righteous today because of that. He took your sins. But let me tell you one more thing. Not only did he take your sin. Gethsemane tells us that his blood was shed right there for your sin. The cross, I believe, was nothing about your sin. The cross was taking the keys back from Satan. The cross was telling Satan, he's finished. When Christ cried out, it is finished! He went into the depths of hell and says, give me those keys. Isaiah says his blood was shed so I could be whiter than snow. When he got up to show you the, even the power and the love that he had even there. And we wanted to come at the introduction this morning. There's so much more but we will finish now. But when he got up and he, he walked, he walked the, his disciples up and they walked and he was between 300 and 600 soldiers. And he said, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. Two things happened, church. First thing, they all fell down under the power. I am. Don't be scared of your neighbors. Don't be scared of your enemies. Don't be scared of your circumstances. I am in charge. I am in charge. We travel all over the world. We were just saying the other day, I was telling my daughter, we looked at it just, just a couple of months ago, my wife and I, for the last 20 odd years, we've traveled all over the world preaching the gospel with no money in our pocket. And if we weigh it up, we've never asked for a cent from anyone. And if we weigh it up, we have probably spent in the last 20 odd years between 100,000 and 200,000 on airfares and so forth. And we did it with nothing in our pocket. Because we were agents of God. He provided. The trip I went to Kenya, the last hundred dollars came in. The Sunday I was leaving on the Tuesday. The total cost covered. And yet we never asked for a second. That's what it's about, church. There in the garden, in front of those 600 men, he said, I am. They fell down under the power. Now let me show you something exciting here. Go to John chapter 19. In John chapter 19, he cries out in verse 30. So when, um, sorry. Eighteen. 
and verse 8. And Jesus answered. Now Jesus is talking to the soldiers. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am the Therefore, if you seek me, let these, my disciples, be not harmed. Christ put conditions. Now, I could, we don't have time. I could go and show you time and time again how Christ supernaturally got through those that wanted to kill him. But on this occasion, he allowed himself to be taken for redemption. But he, he laid conditions. One last thing as I close. When Christ stood there before those soldiers and he said, I am. The Gospel of Mark tells us that at that very moment, there was a boy in a grave who rose from the dead, ran and grabbed hold of Christ. And the soldiers went to stop him and they grabbed uh, and they grabbed the material and it says the child ran away naked. The material was the embalming material. That's what the word in the Greek means. At that moment, Christ was showing that he was God of the dead. After he rose again, he went to the disciples. He was in the upper room. He just appeared. It was locked. Just a room like this. It was locked. He walked through the walls. He looked at them and he loved every one of them. Showed them the holes. Showed them the hole in the side. And do you know right now, in the Middle East, every day, Christ is appearing to Muslims, showing them the halls. And they're getting saved, getting changed, getting transformed. I could give you story after story, but we don't have time. So let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Tonight we will minister a slightly different, but I never know what's going to happen because I just give everything to the Holy Spirit. You see in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2, it talks about the seven ministries of the Holy Spirit. I'm writing a book on it. And the sixth ministry of the Holy Spirit is the spirit of knowledge. And so I just say, God... Give me the theme and then you give me the words as I preach. The theme this morning is a challenging theme to the church. And the question is quite simple. Here is Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. On his knees alone. We have the cross up there. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. On his knees alone. The question, church, is he going to stay alone or are you going to come and fall on your face beside him? That's the simple question. I don't want you to sing. Let's just have the music. Today, if you're going to make that step, I don't care if you've made it a million times before. If you're going to make that step, I want you to come out. Just fall on your knees. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me. I should have been in Gethsemane with you. Or even right now, as Christ is interceding for the church, is he interceding on his own? Or are you going to be there with him? you to start standing and coming out along this black line. Bow on your knees or stand. Begin to do it.
should not be a person in the room, in the chair. 